Okay. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We thought last week I had you thinking and feeling maybe a little queasy about all of our worldly possessions, why you don't get off the hook this week either. Um, this week was harder on me than last week was in preparing. It was just as in my face as last week was. Over and over I was reminded how far off my priorities can get. And that's rather disheartening, especially when you're expected to be behind a pulpit on Sunday and, and preach about priorities and preach about values and preach about what God's Word has to say. So we'll just try to stick to that and not tell you how well I'm faring. How's that? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 24. We'll reread that. But we're going to focus this evening on verses 22 and 23 for the most part. But this is what uh, Jesus says. Again, this is a teaching for disciples. This is not that this isn't good for every man, but this teaching is directed toward you and I, followers of Jesus. It's only going to make sense to people who have been regenerated. It's the only way it's going to make sense because there's so much of this that is, is anti-world. And uh, people of the world just aren't going to get a lot of this. So keep that in mind. He's speaking to us. He was speaking to those who were already following him at that time. And uh, he has some very specific things to tell them now about living in the kingdom while living on this earth and how to keep priorities and loyalty straight. So he says in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness... How great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I ran across this uh, commentary by a Dr. Campbell, and I searched for an hour, and I could not find out which Dr. Campbell it was. It doesn't matter like what the man has to say regardless of which Dr. Campbell it was. He says, Our Lord's argument stands thus. The eye is the lamp of the body. From it, all the other members derive their light. Now, if that which is the light of the body be darkened, how miserable will the state of the body be? How great will be the darkness of those members which have no light of their own, but depend entirely on the eye. Thus, if the conscience, the mental light, that which God has made to man for regulating his moral conduct, if that be vitiated, that is to make moral conduct ineffective, what will the state of his appetites and passions be, which are naturally blind and precipitate, which means that they come quickly? So basically the guy's saying, if we take our morals out of the equation or make them ineffective, what's that going to do for our mind's ability to control our desires and our appetites? Because... When it comes to desires and appetites, they are blind. They're completely reactive to, to what leads them. Okay, and, and they come on us before we really know how to handle ourselves a lot of times. So, the eye, Jesus says, is the lamp of the body. The eye 
described as a lamp. Now, the eye does not illuminate. You all have seen uh, a cat caught in your headlights, how the eyes will glow. Our eyes don't do that, although there were some in the past that thought that's what Jesus was saying. It is not. The eye is the vessel that allows in light to this organ, the mind. Okay? The purpose of the mind is what? To evaluate knowledge. To evaluate knowledge. In Scripture, light represents knowledge. Light represents knowledge in Scripture. Okay? Now, the function of the lamp, we, we all understand Jesus tells us in, in Luke eleven thirty three. How, how many have ever lived where you didn't have a light switch to throw and, you're, and you relied on a lamp? One, two, three, four, five? I've been there, but I didn't live there. Okay. It's a rare thing for most of us living today to realize uh, what a lamp does. And the position of a lamp. Now, we realize that, you know, positioning of light is important. But when you're just talking about a glowing lamp, Jesus says that no one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. So it's a simple metaphor. The light equals knowledge. The eye equals the mind. What the what? The eye brings in, the mind is able to discern. Okay? So then the next word picture element he gives us is the body. Is he talking about the physical body? We just read about members. Eh, not really. Kind of. I mean, yeah, our body reacts to what we see somewhat, but he's talking about some, something much more. This is what it's not by Paul the inert state of our body, before, before the Holy Spirit came to dwell in us. Romans 7, 5, while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Does that mean, is Paul saying that we were using our arms and legs to go around killing people? Well, maybe, but no, that's not really what he meant. Okay, The body... The flesh represented our whole being. It, it represented, the body represented the way we look at things, our attitude, our motive, our whole way of living. Okay, There's kind of an all-inclusive picture here with the body. And it has a unique relationship to the eye. Right? The body is dependent on sensory information to the eye. We see things, it affects, yeah, how we move, but it also affects how we act and, and what our attitude is. We can, be, can you not be disgusted by what you see? Yeah, you avoid it and go the other way, but we're disgusted by that. We're repulsed or we're enthralled. You know? we, we can be moved just by what we see. Sight is very important. So the status of an eye is incredibly important, as Jesus puts it. The first example he gives is a healthy eye in the ESV, or the NIV says, good. There are other versions that say, clear. But the best version is the King James. It says, single. A single eye. Is that what he means? No. That's not what he means. Single eye. We'll get to that. Kind of talking about this. Simple vision versus complex vision. A healthy eye has clarity of vision. It's not blurred. It has no speck to dislodge. Okay, It's able to let light in. There's nothing clouding it up. Matthew 7, 4, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't even see past the log in your own eye? Okay. It's also purity of vision, looking toward heaven instead of looking at earthly things, seeking out things that are of kingdom value or kingdom worth instead of earthly value or earthly worth. 
complexity of vision. Now we'll get back to that. This is why single is so good. The word in the Bible, which the King James translates single, means a cloth folded one time. It's literally what it means. Okay, You can see, if we fold this cloth one time, we have one crease. Right? Watch what happens when we start to make things complex. I'm going to fold the cloth twice now. And then I'm going to fold it three times. Okay. One, or one fold, one crease. Three folds. Now look at the complexity of the creases. How they interact with one another. This has just gotten incredibly complex. Okay, So the idea is single vision as opposed to double vision. Have any of you ever had double vision? It's difficult to decide what's the one and what's not, right? I've never had it. I've heard about it, okay? So, we get an example of this in Scripture. Acts 2.46, of all places, another place where this is used, the, the whole idea of this simplicity or this singleness, day by day with one mind, day by day with one mind, in the temple, Breaking bread, they continued from house to house. They took their meat with gladness and simplicity of heart. Day by day, with one mind, with simplicity of heart. They kept their relationship with the Lord simple. Their vision was simple, not complex. Their purity was simple, wasn't clouded. And you talk about division in the church. There are a lot of things that divide the church. You know, we have differences in doctrine among the church. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, Nick Michael shared with us a lesson. And at that time quoted how many denominations there were in the United States. Anybody want to guess? Anybody? 44,000. Is that complex or simple? <laughs> That's a lot of arguing over the color of carpet, if you ask me. Okay? Now, all of this that we're talking about, you got to remember the context of this. Money. This is all about money, money, money. Stuff. Mammon. Everything that Jesus is talking about, the... the <laughs> The context of this is our relationship with our stuff as followers of Christ and our attitude toward that stuff and our attitude toward, toward God and, and, and where our loyalty lies in all this. Okay, So, the result of a healthy eye, Jesus says, is our whole body will be full of light. A healthy eye will allow our whole body to be full of light, which means we have understanding. We have clear kingdom focus. All members are dependent on the eye. Job chapter 17, verse 7, Job says, My eye has grown dim, dim from vexation, and all my members are like a shadow. Because of his grief, Job Job's clarity, his vision is starting to become clouded. And his vision is becoming dimmed. You know how Job starts eh, having an issue with God? Kind of out loud. Not with, not with uh, real kind feelings or attitude toward God. But he, at this point in the book of Job, is losing his source for hope. He's not holding on to it like he should. Okay. So reaction of members to illumination or light, it's good and profitable, as it should be. We have to allow in good light. The good, in, the good eye allows in light or understanding to an otherwise fallen, natural, worldly body. That's what we have, folks. That, that's what we were born into. That, that's where our genes 
have brought us to since the fall of man. We are born into a sinful nature, a sinful body. Now, am I saying there isn't any innocence? That's not what I'm saying. You all know what I'm talking about. We have a sinful nature, a propensity to sin. We're born with it. We can't get away from it. So we need that good eye. An unhealthy eye, double vision. And how does that re how does that work with money? Well, you get a complex vision of money. You get a complex vision of money. Disciples of Jesus ha who have an issue with this have more than one heart motive and desire with money. More than one. Jesus says you can't even have two. You will either hate the one or love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. <coughs> the desire or conclusion that Jesus is coming to in all this is, is if we jump ahead a little in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he tells us, he tells us that we must first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. What things? All things. For sure the necessities. We're going to find out what these things are coming up. It's going to be food, clothing, necessities. But we'll find out in Scripture that God intends to bless us abundantly. Abundantly. But our attitude should be first and foremost the kingdom of God. Our base motivation is in the way I interact with money should be based upon His kingdom and His righteousness. Everything that is ours is a gift or a blessing from Him. Everything is. You know, we, we didn't even get to choose who we were born to. And if you don't think that has an effect on the rest of your life, you're kidding yourself. One way or another. Who you were born to has an effect on who you will be become. Health, attitude, propensity to understand things. Everything that is ours is a gift, blessing from Him. Does the world see it this way? Does the person without the Lord in their life see that every blessing they have or everything they have is a gift from God? They don't have spiritual vision. No. Where do they think it comes from? Good, good, for, good fortune. Their own power. Even luck. Okay? God has nothing to do with it. We have a greater purpose with our money than the world or natural man. We have a greater purpose with the stuff that we've been blessed with than the world or the natural man. Why do you think God showers you with abundant blessing? So you can pass it on to those in need. So you can do kingdom work. Is spending money for enjoyment sinful? What do you think? 1 Timothy 6.17 We talked about this last week. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. And I charged us all not to be haughty, right? Because we're all rich. Worldly, worldly stage, we are rich. Okay? nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So I ask you again, is spending money for our enjoyment sinful? No. It is not sinful. God wants you to enjoy the food you buy. He wants you to enjoy the home you live in. He's blessed you with these things. <clears throat> but He wants you to understand where they came from and give Him praise and glory and honor for the blessing. And He doesn't want you to hoard the surplus. Now, you can set some back as an inheritance. That's biblical. But folks, we can't take any of this with us. It's... <laughs> 
come into the world naked, we go out without a thing too. Okay? We can go too far with the idea that God wants us to enjoy everything. This is more than just the necessities that God is talking about. It's an abundant blessing from the Lord, but we must keep the thought of this that it's not just for my enjoyment, but it's for His purposes. So, this home that I enjoy so much, how am I going to use it, along with my enjoyment, for kingdom work? I know some very hospitable people in here, particularly women, that have a real gift for that. You've used your home for God's will and His purpose. Okay, That's just an example. Men, you're all right too, but I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> Self-indulgence is what we must avoid. Okay, Just enjoying things just because we want to enjoy them. We always need to have the right attitude. Okay? <clears throat> Body, again, represents your whole life or soul condition, not just our physical body. The way we look at things through our good eye or bad eye determines the way we look at life. Are we focused on the kingdom in our way of looking at things, or are we focused on mammon? Where does our allegiance lie? I ran across this illustration I thought was excellent. If all of a sudden you had an infusion of $10,000 from out of nowhere, no strings attached, come your way, cash money. Is your first thought, what am I going to do for the kingdom, or is it, man, what can I get? I didn't like my answer very much. It's my first thought when I read that was I'd be guilty of Seeing the wrong thing, thinking the wrong thing. Is that before or after the first 10%? Because <laughs> that's the first thought. It's like, okay. Well, whatever, let me ask you this. Whatever you get first 10 Let me ask you know? this. Can we do both? Can we, can, we, can we say, how much stuff can we get, and how can I use this for God's kingdom? as long as you prioritize. Okay. It, 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 first, whatever you want, second. Okay. Still, it's, it's still a matter of motive. still a matter of priority. Very good, yeah. Remember the example, though, of the rich young ruler. Bring this up again. Loaded young man. Comes up to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus hits him with the six human relational commands or commandments. Leaves the relational commandments to God clear out of the picture. This is just us here, he says. Have you kept all these commands? I've kept them since I was a child. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. He said, you lack one thing. Sell your possessions and come follow me. Give them to the poor and follow me. And how did that young man go away? Sad. Sad. But let me ask you this question. About ten steps in his grief-stricken state, do you think he thought, I'm not right with God? Or did he think, you know what? I'm just doing pretty good. I really am. I've kept those commands. I can keep my money and handle it. I always have felt like... Hmm? I think he did. And, and go ahead, and I'll get back to it. I, I've always felt like he was sad because he didn't want to sell everything he had, and he knew it made him not right with God. Mm -hmm. Could be. Yeah, he realized it meant more to him than, mm -hmm. than God didn't ask serving you for God. All of it. He said, go sell. He didn't say give everything you have to the poor. He said give to the poor. No, he I thought he said, sell, sell all your possessions. Sell, sell, everything. Everything. sell all your yeah. possessions yeah, said, and give them to all. the poor. And then come follow me. Well, so he tells the man, go get your 
stuff right, then you can come follow me. And he knew peering into this young man's heart mm-hmm. that this young man couldn't do it. And it's the one thing that he picked out. And yeah, he may have felt bad for that reason, but he felt bad for that reason because he loved his stuff. Okay? But he also thought he loved God because he had kept all those commandments since he was a child. See, he thought he loved God and he thought he loved his stuff, both. And he thought he could handle them both. And he did go away, Dad, because he wasn't willing to do what Jesus required, regardless of why he felt bad. But he suffered with double vision. He had his eye on two different balls. Okay? And when we suffer with double vision, we're dealing with dark light. (laughs) Does that make sense? Dark light. And that equals self-deception. Dark light brings self-deception. We fool ourselves into thinking we're okay. We convince ourselves that we're okay. This is why this is so dangerous. This is why it's so subtle. Listen to the old reformer, the old Methodist, John Wesley. He closes out his thoughts on this subject matter in one of his sermons. I'll try to... I've never heard John Wesley a long time ago. I call upon you more especially who are called Methodists. In the sight of the great God... Upwards of 50 years, I have ministered unto you. I have been your servant for Christ's sake. And during this time, I have given you many solemn warnings on his head. I now give you one more, perhaps the last. Dare any of you, in choosing your calling or situation, I the things on earth rather than the things above? In choosing a profession or a companion for life for your child? Do you look at earth or at heaven? And can you deliberately prefer, either for yourself or your offspring, a child of the devil with money to a child of God without it? While the heavens cry out, O souls bowed down to earth, strangers to heaven. Repent, repent of your vile earthly mindedness. Renounce the title of Christians, or prefer, both in your case and the case of your children, grace to money and heaven to earth. For the time to come at least, let your eye be single, that your whole body may be full of light. Now I ask myself this question. I said, what do I want for my girls? And finally, when it wasn't me involved in the picture, I answered correctly wasn't concerned about the wealth. Now that made me feel a little better. Okay, When it comes to my girls, I want them to find a young man who said this a thousand times, just like Daniel Millette. <laughs> That's my guy. And there's a reason why, and it's not because Daniel's loaded, because he's not. You all know Daniel just like I do, and I'm not trying to put him up on a pedestal, but that's the kind of young man I want for my girls. Okay, Not one like their dad was, but one like he is. Okay, So what do we wish for our children? What do we want for ourselves? Is it worldly comfort, sin, and riches, or heavenly blessings? They may look nothing alike, but they may look a lot alike. It depends on what God feels your talent is and how you will use it for his kingdom. He will bless you accordingly. And all of us, I probably should get an amen, especially from the guys on this, all of us are not well equipped to handle money. Oh, smart men. Smart men. Remember, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Our basic needs plus more will be added unto you. Now, another really good commentary that I wanted to share with you. This is from Lloyd-Jones' book. He says, sin is the final ruination which leaves a man with nothing at the end. Still worse, in a sense, is this that at the, ta- at the end he also finds that he has been entirely and utterly wrong all of his life. 
Our Lord puts it like this. The light, the, eye, the, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If, there, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? That is a picture which means this. As we have seen, the light of the body is, in a sense, the mind, the understanding, this extraordinary faculty that God gave to man. If, as a result of sin and evil, and because of the control of the heart, and the lust, and the passion, and desire, this supreme instrument has become perverted, how great is that darkness? Is anything worse than that, or more terrible than that? We can look at it like this. Man today, natural man, as we have been saying, and as we know full well, not only believes he is being led by his mind, he rejects God because of his mind and understanding. <laughs> he laughs at religion. He laughs at those who denounce this worldly view of life. He lives for the present. It is the one thing that counts and believes that to be a rational point of view to take. He proves it to his own satisfaction, and is convinced that he is led by his mind. He does not realize that the light that is in him has become dark. He does not realize that the light that is in him has become dark. He doesn't even know. He does not see that his faculties have become upset because of sin. He does not see that the various forces are controlling and drudging his mind, which is therefore no longer operating freely and rationally. But at the end, he will come to see it. At the end, he will come to see himself like the prodigal son of old. Suddenly, he will see that the things in which he trusted were dark and have misled him and that he has lost everything. The light in him is darkness, and oh, how great is that darkness. There is nothing worse than that, to discover at the end that the very thing to which you pin your faith is the one thing that has let you down. The natural man, if he's self-reliant, self-sufficient, has pinned all of his hopes on his riches, <laughs> He's going to come to the end of his life and see that what he has put his faith in, his energy in, has let him down. All for nothing. All for nothing. All for nothing. That's that scripture where the rich man had built his, filled these bins and he said, you know, I'm going to tear these down and build bigger ones and then I'll be set the rest of my life. And God says, thy fool, and your soul will be required of you. There's nothing that brings home this more than facing your mortality. And then you think, how about facing your immortality? How about the rich man and Lazarus? There was a rich man who was clothed in 